Are you going through a divorce with a narcissist and your lawyer or the teams are bringing in GALs or PREs or any of these parental coordination people to make decisions in your divorce? Today, I've got Ryan Calamara, who is a lawyer here in Colorado. He's got his own podcast called um, Divorce at Altitude, and he's brilliant. And we're going to talk about this and answer all the questions that are so common when people get on my screen and go, what about this? What about this? I put all those questions together and we're going to get him to answer them. So let's go watch what Ryan gives us for this answer, because it's going to help enlighten and demystify what happens when these folks get involved in your divorce. Welcome, Ryan. I am so excited to see you again. I'm in Tracy. Good to see you again. Well, today we're going to talk about guardian ad litems. And so let's start off by asking and answering what is a guardian ad litem? So there's a, a guardian ad litem is a technical term that it's actually used um, a little bit differently now in divorces. So a guardian ad litem can be a representative for children in a dependence, dependency and neglect case. Those still exist. Uh, but there can also be a guardian ad litem for a party who has uh, who's not competent or can't make decisions for themselves. Uh, really, when a lot of uh, people go through a divorce and they ask about guardian ad litems, they're thinking of what is called a child legal representative, which I can uh, explain um, what that is if you want. Yeah, that will help. Because again, we, we're just educating people who don't know this stuff yet. And their lawyer just said the word. They're like, what? <laughs> Right. So it used to be known as a as a GAL or a guardian ad litem, but now the legislature in Colorado has, has changed the term. And so it's a child legal uh, representative. Oftentimes, divorce lawyers, we refer to them as CLRs. Um, and they kind of, I mean, we in divorce world, we have a lot of acronyms. So there's PREs for parental responsibilities evaluators, CFIs for child and family investigators. Um, but a CLR is an attorney uh, that is appointed on behalf of uh, the children, and they advocate for the best interests uh, of the children. So it's essentially a, a, the, a lawyer that represents uh, the children um, and really advocates uh, for them. They are frequently brought in in high conflict uh, divorces. Um, I know your your audience, um, you know, the, the, the narcissism and, and that frequently leads into high conflict, uh, personalities and high conflict, uh, divorces. Yeah. Yeah. Do people have a choice? Is this court appointed or they go, I want more help. And, and then it gets assigned. So they, they can agree. There's, there's times when, uh, you know, there's just so much, uh, turmoil, uh, that people can agree uh, to the uh, appointment. Um, oftentimes, however, it, it is filed uh, by one motion. You know, we have hypothetical divorce uh, avatars or clients um, stories, uh, Tracy, as, as listeners may know. So we reference Eric and Melanie Wolf uh, in, in, in their kind of hypothetical divorce. So if Eric Wolf thinks, for example, that uh, Melanie is a narcissist and is alienating the kids and and doing, you know, just, uh, you know, really horrible things, he can then file a motion for the appointment of a uh, CLR. Now the, the, the costs, I, I know we'll get into costs. Um, you know, the costs, uh, you know, are, are ordered by the court and, but the, the CLR is going to be, you know, another uh, uh, chef in the, in the kitchen, so to speak. Um, but can really um, advocate on behalf of the children. And Eric may want that because he wants kind of an independent uh, person that that kind of buttress or or augment what him and his legal counsel could be telling uh, the court is is going on. Right. And that's that's what people need to understand. This is not used all the time. It's specifically for, you know, serious cases where there's such disagreement and they can't even come to a little bit closer and and again if there's abuse or neglect or anything like that these these get called in by you as a lawyer or by you going to the judge and that's how it gets called in and and frequently tracy these cases i think it may be helpful for listeners i know that we're talking specifically about clrs but to maybe kind of contrast them with some of the other professionals that are involved in typically you know high conflict custody 
uh, battle. So I mentioned the kind of acronyms. So, uh, you know, a PRE is a parental responsibilities evaluator. And then there's a CFI. Both of those are more in the forensic role. So they're going to be a neutral party that comes in and speaks with the children, um, you know, if, if, if appropriate, you know, if they're four years old or, or older, generally the, the parents or the evaluator really is going to talk uh, with the, the child uh, and then, you know, examine and, and really watch and observe the children um, during parenting time. Uh, so that's in a forensic role. Uh, then you also have something that's somewhat similar to uh, a CLR, and that is a special master. Um, a special master can be appointed by a court and really kind of get into the nitty gritty and talk with therapists and and really make um, you know, recommendations, but also talk with the the children and and kind of take a little bit new uh, a, a role of advocating either for the children and and you know talking with them. So you know the CLR, um, you know I I had a case involving a CLR and I represented you know uh, uh, one of them, um, the 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 one child actually, and she was um, over the age of eighteen. And, you know, it was a really complex case, but, you know, the, the children met with the CLR, they told her what the, she wanted. Um, and then she went to the court and said, you know, I, I think that these concerns are, are warranted and, um, you know, can really advocate. Whereas, you know, a, a forensic they're, they're going to do a report and, um, you know, they'll kind of make one recommendation. Uh, so I think it's, but it's just helpful for people to kind of understand, you know, where these different professionals fit. There's also the PCDM, which is a parenting coordinator decision maker. That's more for after the divorce. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's really kind of an on-call mediator who then has the ability to um, make binding decisions. Typically PCDMs, they don't, uh, talk with, you know, the, the, the children, um, a CFI, a PRE, they're going to talk with the children and the CLR is definitely going to talk, uh, with the children, which kind of then, um, you know, leads us into, well, you know, how should I talk with the kids and, you know, prepare them and, and some of the fears, uh, and concerns that obviously your, your, uh, audience is going to have. Yeah. And, and, and that makes, uh, leads us into like, how do we tell our children? Because that 18 year old you described, it's real easy to explain. This is why this is who they are. You know, answer your, yourself, however you want to, but, but when they're three and five, like, is there an age point where they go, okay, only after six, do we talk to the children? Is there something like that? There are guidelines for at least the forensics uh, and, and, you know, off the top of my head, I don't know what those guidelines are. It is in that three to four to five age uh, range where, you know, some and, and different professionals will uh, they'll disagree or they'll at least have, you know, explanations or decisions, professional guidance on w when exactly do they talk uh, with the kids, but they're kind of specially trained and it's not like, do you like mom better than dad? They don't ask it something directly. And really what they're going to ask the kids is tell me about the things that you do with your uh, dad, you know, Eric Wolf. And, you know, he could, the, the child could say, you know, we, we go, uh, we play and, and we uh, go skiing. I live up in the mountains or we go for bike rides or dad does this. He's silly or, and, and if there's allegations of abuse, then, you know, there's obviously sp specific kind of ways of, you know, dad touches me or does something like that. And the evaluator is, there are specific trainings um, that these evaluators uh, do. They, they come up in criminal cases, um, in forensic interviews, and there really are kind of some special protocols that, um, you know, come up. And so if, uh, you know, your listeners are concerned about abuse, then, you know, that is certainly uh, something that uh, can uh, come up, but they don't really go out and ask specifically, um, you know, do you like mom more than uh, dad or uh, do you think dad's a bad guy? They, they're more indirect and they um, ask questions about, you know, the types of activities and, you know, what they either like or other things. And, you know, they, they're specifically uh, trained and by virtue of, you know, what, 
uh, because the, these evaluators, the forensic evaluators, and the same thing is going to happen with the CLRs is you're going to, they're, they're often going to triangulate the information. So they're not going to specifically just, you know, rely on just what the children say. They're going to talk to the children's, you know, school, uh, those, the, the neutral collaterals is what they call them. Those are the most kind of helpful and uh, most persuasive. So if a school counselor, if a doctor, uh, a therapist, a counselor, the soccer coach, you know, the teacher, if, you know, they say I've observed, you know, bruising or, you know, Johnny has said that, you know, he he's fearful when he goes to dad or, you know, he uh, wets his pants um, you know, more often or has anxiety, doesn't show up at school, the CLR and the, the forensic, you know, evaluator, they're going to be able to figure that out. So it's not just reliant on uh, the, the children, but, you know, to your overall point of what should I tell the, the children, I think it's really, you know, something that is going to depend on the circumstances. You know, certainly I don't think if, if Eric Wolf is, you know, they're, they're a CLR or a GAL, you know, any sort of kind of professional is going to be involved. You know, there's going to be specific, you shouldn't say now tell the CLR how bad mommy is, um, you know, that, that would be inappropriate and can, you know, oftentimes backfire. Um, but I think that there are specific things that people are really going to need to um, talk with a, a lawyer and a professional and their therapist or someone like you, uh, Tracy, about, you know, how do you have that conversation with, with the children? Yeah. I, I, thank you so much for that because people fear this so much, right? And when I am talking with them and their kids are about to have these kind of interviews, I'm like, reassure them that these people are their friends and that they are here to make sure everything's okay in their life. Just diffuse the the fear that the child might have not understanding who this person is. So however you frame it, you're just trying to say, you know, they're safe and you can say anything you want to, honey. And, you know, don't worry. There's no pressure. We want to take the pressure off the kids. Absolutely. And I think, it, you know, that's, it's really hard because oftentimes these uh, forensic, you know, evaluators and, you know, GALs or CLRs, they're in for a while. Um, so they do gain some, excuse me, institutional knowledge, but there is that first impression really does matter. And when, and, and when a CLR comes and they interview uh, the children, then, you know, like if they're having, if they didn't sleep the night before, if they have, you know, some sort of illness that can really matter. Um, and where the, the children were the night before or that day when they go to visit, uh, you know, the, it, it is important for parents that those impressions do matter. Um, and it can even be a little bit overzealous or over, you know, like when people overdo it, then it can come off as constructed or in insincere. And that's not, um, you know, something, but, you know, if your kid shows up for a meeting with a CLR or, you know, uh, uh, an evaluator comes and the kids are, you know, uh, dis you know, they're misbehaving, they're dirty. They, you know, they've had a long, uh, week. I know that, you know, we're recording this on uh Friday. My, my kids are, uh, cashed out at the end of, of a school week and they tend to be cranky and not on their best behavior. The, the evaluator and the CLR, they, they, they are aware of that oftentimes, but it's, it's something that people should plan um, ahead and, and really make sure they're on time. They're respectful because there is a lot riding a, on these uh, decisions and um, anything you can do for a, an advantage. I, I think people should be mindful of that. So they should be respectful. They should be on time. Um, and, you know, they should uh, make sure that uh, their children are on, you know, their best behavior. Yeah, that really helps too. Thank you. Because we forget those normal, like every Friday, they're going to be cranky or, you know, they just had practice and now they're going to come home and, and you can't, you know, they're all whacked up from playing soccer for the last two hours. It's hard to sit down, be focused, pay attention and give, you know, helpful answers, especially if they're young, right? The, the older they are, the more we can expect them to be able to switch their emotions from playing soccer and being up and up to going, okay, I'm going to sit down and talk. So, you know, just to know that that is an important 
piece of this. Thank you. I think that a lot of people are going to be like, okay, did you have a good meal? Make sure you have a good breakfast. You're like, we can do that. We know how, but we forget to prep our children with those simple things. Yeah. And I think uh, the fear that you mentioned, it it is absolutely something I hear a lot about because, you know, if, if Eric and Melanie, you know, in our hypothetical scenario, if they're going to go forward and have someone involved, you know, uh, uh, an evaluator or a CLR, uh, then, you know, they, they're going to feel judged. Uh, they're going to be concerned if the other party, if Eric is concerned that Melanie is a, you know, narcissist, they are going to be really concerned about, well, Melanie is, is, can be very charismatic uh, and they're going to win over the evaluator. They're going to win over the CLR. Um, they're going to win over they're They're, they're just going to, you know, lie. And, and I, what am I supposed to do about that? And I hear that a lot. I think that those fears are, are pretty common. Um, what I tell clients is that when you have a, an extended kind of track record or extended, you know, period of, you know, uh, an engagement and they can go and talk with other people, they usually, you know, that is when, you know, those, uh, those kind of closet narcissists or, you know, the people that have some sort of pathology or, or personality disorder, you, you know, that is when it can be found out in contrast, people just want to roll the dice and they go to trial, uh, you know, and they don't have an evaluator or they don't have a, a CLR. That is when, you know, that it, it, there is a real, re, you know, uh, fear and a reasonable fear that, you know, if Melanie is charismatic and, and the judge just hears two hours of her testimony and that's all that the judge hears, you know, that is something that I, I would submit is even a, a greater risk for Eric if if he's concerned about, you know, Melanie being a narcissist. Um, and, you know, costs are always a concern. Oh, yes. And absolutely. I mean, the fears are common that people would be worried that the covert like kindness and sweetness and, and you know, all of that charm is going to come out is based on years and years of learning that lesson. They're going to pull this card. There's no question about it. Right. But I'd like to say we have to have confidence in these evaluators, but I've also seen a lot of evaluators that have picked the wrong side or, you know, not believed the, the, I'll say the mother with this much information because the father was so charming. I mean, right now I can tell you as of this recording, Tracy, there's real, there's a robust discussion and it's a, a major, I mean, it, people have called it a crisis or, um, you know, a, a real issue is that the evaluations that are being done in Colorado there, there's a real concern about that, uh, you know, the, the kind of more qualified, more reputable, more experienced evaluators, they're leaving the practice. Um, and so there's actually, you know, a legit discussion of uh, what is the future of these professionals, the CLRs, they, you know, they are, you know, fairly rare, um, and you know, they, they are an extra cost. I would say that CLRs are far more, um, you know, extraordinary or infrequent, um, compared to evaluators when, you know, dealing with, uh, parenting, uh, disputes. So, and, and CLR is one thing I think is a critical, uh, you know, distinction is they can't do psychological testing, um, on, you know, parties in a divorce. They merely, not merely, but they, they advocate for the best interests of, uh, the child, but an evaluator, a PRE, um, for example, they do do psychological testing. So, um, you know, it's more likely it's not like a psychological testing, like an MMPI, the multiple, the Minnesota multiple personality index is like an X-ray. Um, some people think that that's like an X-ray machine for is someone bipolar or someone, a narcissist, uh, you know, in some sort of kind of personality disorder, but it, it is more likely that that is, is determined, um, and diagnosed in a PRE uh, compared to any sort of engagement, which I think is important for listeners to kind of understand that dynamic. That really helps. I'm, I'm learning things too. I'm like, oh, there's an insight here. That's awesome. So we mentioned in this little snippet here about the cost and the difference between some of them you're going to have to pay and, and, and some could be court appointed 
I mean, I think they're all court appointed, but some are paid for by the court. How does the funding for this happen? Yeah, in certain circumstances, uh, CFIs, so child and family investigators, uh, if the parties or the the if the parties involved, if they um, fall below a certain threshold, there can be either sliding scale or uh, they can be paid for you know, uh, by the state. As of now, the cap on the uh, cost for a uh, CFI is uh, $2,750 for the engagement. Um, and so the, the costs, you know, are generally split between the parties. Uh, there can, the court, you know, can subject to reallocation, which means that the court can say, you know, Eric, you, uh, Wolf, you need to pay for all of the costs, you know, that usually comes out of the marital estate. Um, and so it is something that, um, you know, people are going to pay for oftentimes Tracy, what I have a conversation with my clients about is, you know, depending on the severity and the issues involved, um, you know, the, it generally kind of starts out with the CFI, they're the least expensive, uh, and then you kind of move on to a PRE, um, a PRE is going to cost anywhere between five and $20,000. It really depends on, uh, whether or not they're traveling, uh, their qualifications. Um, and I know that, you know, for listeners who can't see on, on the video, you know, <laughs> you, you, your mouth, your jaw dropped, um, you know, that, it, 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 it really, it, it is a significant amount of money. The, the kind of thing that I'll tell people is that it's more likely that their case is going to settle and that you'll get a full history. If Eric and Melanie are, you know, fighting over uh, everything, they can't agree uh, on the color of the sky and specifically when, um, or especially rather when uh, personality disorders. So if, if someone's a narcissist, you know, that it's more likely that that case is going to go to uh, trial. And, you know, then, and as I said before, you know, it's really rolling the, the, the dice. If you don't have a professional involved, it's not a guarantee that if the PRE is ordered and does an evaluation and says, you know, Melanie's a narcissist, that doesn't mean that, you know, Melanie's going to agree uh, that uh, she's a narcissist. And if she's a narcissist, she's probably just going to reject the PRE and say, I'm going to go forward to, to, to trial. But, you know, it is more likely that the case is going to settle. And so oftentimes what I tell people is it's less expensive to have a, a good, reputable PRE um, the, in terms of avoiding trial. And the other benefit that I think, you know, people need to take into consideration when it comes to cost is the is a PRE, they will come up with a comprehensive uh, report that's going to stay in the court file uh, for, you know, forever and ever. Uh, and that will, you know, be uh, there, there can be some institutional knowledge that exists with that. So when you have different judges, uh, you know, assigned to a case, I mean, up in Eagle County, for example, there's been a huge turnover in the judges. And so if you go to trial, uh, in front of judge, you know, Owens, uh, and then he moves over to Breckenridge. Well, you're starting all over with, uh, you know, judge Fresquez, for example, but if you have that PRE report, you know, two years later, three years later, it, it can, it can really help as far as a CLR is concerned that GA, GAL concept, um, you know, often these attorneys, I mean, they're, they're going to charge an hourly rate. And if, they're at, you know, $300 an hour, you can very easily get up into, you know, the 10, $20,000 range very quickly. Because if you go to trial, then Eric is going to be, Eric Wolf's going to be paying his lawyer. Uh, Melanie Wolf's going to be paying her lawyer. And then you have a third lawyer sitting there at, you know, trial. And, you know, there, I have seen it, Tracy, where there's also involving, a PRE. So you've got three lawyers, a PRE, multiple witnesses. Sometimes you have a, a special master, you know, and you kind of hit the trifecta. Those cases can easily, you know, get up into um, six figures in terms of the professional fees uh, involved. Um, so it really kind of runs the gamut in terms of uh, the costs. Wow. That's, that's crazy, but it's important that people understand this because there's benefit to them too. Um, and, and what 
what a lot of my clients have happened is we have told them document, 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 right? Write it down. Keep track of that. That might help. We don't know what's going to help. Keep tracking, right? So what kind of all that gathering of documentation goes to any of these service people? Do they look at text messages, for example? Do they look at, you know, the, the irresponsibility of not showing up when they were supposed to? What kind of things do they have to gather and what matters? Yeah, this is where you get into the range of, you know, I mentioned the kind of range of costs and generally speaking, you get what you pay for. And so if you have a PRE, um, they're more likely to go through the the text messages, the audio recordings uh, to look at the calendar to see, uh, you know, in terms of how much time was allocated and, and, and actually exercised. I've certainly uh, seen that. And the reputable PREs, they're going to spend the time. And, and unfortunately, it's going to be really costly, but, you know, they they can. And I think it really is something that I'll go through with my client and walk through, um, you know, in terms of the evidence that they would present. So it could be, you know, audio, it could be social media posts. Um, it could be, you know, so there's so many uh, audio recordings, which I, I, the judges, generally speaking, they'll say those audio recordings uh, that everyone has now, uh, they, they really is a double-edged sword because on one hand it, it can show some prompting because, you know, if Eric Wolf is recording his, uh, conversation with his daughter, for example, or with Melanie Wolf, you know, he could be trying to goad her to get her to, you know, and, and you can hear it on, on the recording. The other thing that judges will say is, why is Eric recording a conversation with his daughter or why is he, it's like this gotcha, you know, that, that really the judges don't like, but I think Eric, it's incumbent on Eric to work through uh, his attorney and to figure out what are the materials that are going to be the most persuasive, you know, it could be timelines. It could be, and, and I think, you know, Tracy, there's certainly a role for a divorce coach to really kind of go through and, and talk with that. But people also need to understand that if they bring in their divorce coach, someone like you or their therapist, or, you know, some of the, they could be opening up, you know, the, the privilege or the uh, Pandora's box. Cause they could be going and getting all the notes, all the emails, you know, to, to you. And people need to really kind of make a decision on whether or not that's something that they uh, want to do is going to be uh, helpful for them. So, and they can also overwhelm, uh, you know, evaluators or people when they throw too much information at people. And so they really, I think that that is where a key professional needs to review that information and help prepare them because it is a pretty standard process. There's standard questionnaires that these evaluators, any, you know, professional dealing with these issues is going to ask. Yeah. Wow, that was awesome. And just for the people who are out of the state of Colorado, it's not legal to record in every state in the U.S. or for people looking at us from another country. Um, just know your rights, know your law, because you could get in some serious big trouble if you're recording your ex or your children. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because we are in Colorado. Uh, so it's a one party, you know, consent state. So that means that Eric Wolf. He just needs to know about, um, you know, the, it being recording. But the other thing too, is people need to be careful of like breaking into the other party's phone, the computer, uh, you know, reviewing their, their children's, uh, messages. They need to be really careful and, and trust, uh, their, uh, attorney when it comes to what they can and cannot do. Absolutely. The, just a warning flag to everyone who's out there because, um, you know, I'm a big proponent because I'm here in Colorado, record, and if nothing comes, you don't need it, but you never know if you're in such high conflict situations that you, that recording won't help you because I've had a situation where my narcissist recorded me and edited it. And, and, it was yeah, and I think that having an attorney that knows technology, that knows the editing you know, capabilities. And we have now like with deep fakes and I mean, they have that they're, I, I'm not famous enough in terms of the podscape or podcast, you know, world, but you know, with, they now have technology where, you know, if someone gathered up my 
audio recordings, they could just make up stuff, uh, you know, in my own voice and, and mannerisms and, uh, all of that, uh, you know, for better, or for worse. Uh, but yeah. And, and, you know, I, I think that that's an important point for people to keep in mind because, uh, you know, the, these concepts of a, almost every state is going to have some sort of custody evaluator. Um, and then almost every state's going to have GAL, uh, or a guardian ad litem or some sort of representative independent for the children in Colorado. What my earlier discussion was, was about CLRs, but that's Colorado and that's specific, but you know, people should check in and, and see the general concepts are, are pretty, you know, similar across the board. Yeah. Yeah. Again, thanks for clarifying that because I have clients in Dubai, Tokyo, they're all over the world listening to this. So it's kind of cool, but it is definitely different laws. So we just want to encourage them to check where they are. Um, what I want to talk to you about now is there's two questions left. Um, everyone says, well, how do I win them over? How, how do I, you know, how, I don't know, like, how do I game the system? Right. And that's not how this works. So is there a way to win them over or is this really bad practice? I think that the, the risk of people trying to game, it, it, it will backfire more often than not. And I think people need to be their authentic selves. They do need to be prepared. And so if they generally run late, I've mentioned that before, if they tend to talk too much, they can dial that back and they, and, but they need to admit, um, I mean, no one is perfect. And if they admit to their faults, you know, and they need to talk and strategize with, you know, the professionals involved, uh, mm -hmm. you know, because there can be some implications, both in terms of admitting to, you know, a crime or, you know, there, there can be, uh, there's going to be issues, uh, that, uh, someone needs to own up to or, or, uh, discuss, but you know, when people really try to, to game it, the evaluators, uh, out there and the professionals out there, there is nothing that is more distasteful than feeling like you are a pawn or that someone's trying to manipulate you. And so the, uh, that can really backfire. I also think that when you just, just, you know, you've, you, uh, either lie or don't, it, you know, admit to something, um, and you know, you claim you're, you're perfect. I have seen that, you know, backfire. And, and when someone doesn't mention something so incredibly obvious. So for example, if Eric Wolf gets a DUI, um, you know, with his children during the, the divorce, and he just doesn't even mention it to the evaluator. I mean, you better believe that Melanie's going to um, mention that. And the evaluator, someone's going to say, I thought it was really weird or, um, you know, really damning that Eric didn't even admit to that. So I think it's a really tricky balance that people need to kind of uh, go through, but there is no winning um, in, in these uh, scenarios. Um, I mean, the, the only circumstance maybe is when someone's trying to relocate, um, a parent's trying to relocate in that circumstance, there do tend to be winners and, and uh, losers. But most of the time, these evaluators, they're going to see both sides of the story um, and the party that is going to, you know, be the most credible is generally going to get the kind of uh, nod or or something in in their favor. Right. Absolutely. And and like you said, they they're professionals. They've seen this all. You know, we think, and often it is in my in my world, it is the narcissist that's trying to pull the wool over the eyes. But again, this is where your evidence, like you said, if he got a DUI and didn't admit it. You're going to look really dumb. You're going to look bad because, yes, she's going to know it, right? They've seen this game before. And so honesty and, and really saying it is, but also having some things that are evidence-based. Like if I'm going to say they never show up, I'm going to have proof of the 20, 30, 50 times they haven't shown up. I'm not going to just throw that out there. Here's the dates. Here's the dates. Here's my proof, right? That also helps bring legitimacy. Yeah, and I think that people need to take, uh, they need to be confident that if their spouse is a narcissist, the narcissist is not going to admit fault. It's by definition who they are, and they're incapable of recognizing their faults. And I, so you need to, you know, be prepared to say, yes, I have faults. You don't need to dwell on them, but, you know, and then you need to also, 
uh, point the uh, finger at the other party, but you can't just sling mud. Um, that is, you know, unattractive. And it depends on where people are in re recovering from their abuse because people could be kind of coming out from under the thumb of the narcissist and really being trying to assert their independence. That's all well and good, but don't do it at the, the, you know, the, when it becomes an obsession of my other, you know, my other spouse, my, my spouse is a, is a narcissist because ultimately one thing that the evaluator and one thing that the judge is going to sit there and say is you married this person, you decided to have kids with them. And that's not to say that, you know, people change and, and, and they go through, uh, you know, changes and, and, and everyone that doesn't mean that it excuses, but just people need to be really careful that oftentimes people in the family law professional space it's not always black and white and you know, it's, it's, there's shades of gray. And when you admit to that, or you acknowledge that, then you come across as far more credible and often will get more of what you want than not. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you. Um, a lot of people I've had get in their opinion, they get bad decisions. They don't like it. Mm -hmm. And they're almost like, can we overturn this? Can we fight it? Can we get another one? Like that's one of the most pressing questions is I don't like the results and, and whether it was true or not. Um, the other people had more evidence and, and it just didn't add up for you. But what do they do if the if they believe that the guardian ad litem or one of these other advocates didn't do a good job? Is there something they can do? Yeah, there's a couple different options. I mean, uh, Tracy, in, on my podcast, Divorce at Altitude, on one of our most popular episodes is how to litigate um, custody disputes. And it gets into examining uh, health professionals. I've written uh, an article in the Colorado Lawyer that came out in January of 2023 um, about this. And, you know, there's there's certainly there are professionals out there. One that I've used, John Zervopoulos, he's been the guest on my podcast a couple different times. He's a, a lawyer and a psychologist in uh, Dallas, who is excellent. And he evaluates or, or looks at these evaluations and helps parties uh, break them down. But, you know, oftentimes what happens is, and, and this is gets into the GAL versus the evaluator, you know, role, the GAL, you know, that is it, when you have someone appointed, uh, you can, you know, kind of criticize them. But generally speaking, at least in Colorado, that GAL is or the CLR is not going to testify. They're going to argue. They're going to, you know, do various, uh, you know, things, but they're not an actual witness. Um, and so, you know, if people have those involved, it can really, you know, there's, there's limited kind of resources or, or mechanisms. If it's an evaluation that goes contrary to what, you know, they, they want, they can ask for another um, evaluation in Colorado. I mentioned PREs. You can then get a supplemental PRE. Then it becomes a battle of the experts. <laughs> uh, the another uh, you know mechanism is a work product uh, expert. Um, I have an episode uh, on my podcast with Andrew Luazo um, who, uh, on specifically on work product experts, and basically it goes through and it dissects an evaluator and says, you didn't follow the protocol. So for example, our discussion earlier on talking with the kids, they caught the child could be, you know, eight years old and the evaluator didn't talk with them. Uh, then you can criticize the evaluator and say, you know, you didn't talk to the, the child. Why not? This is the professional standards. You didn't do this. You didn't do that. And so it's, it, it it's not as if, you know, um, the evaluator, what an expert says goes, it can be with, you know, the proper skill and training by a, a lawyer, you can really break down those, um, those experts and, and, you know, you got to look at what the options are because, uh, you know, if you don't strike that first impression and, and really kind of, um, have the evaluator or, or a GAL on your side, you know, you're, you, there are, you know, it, it makes it a lot harder, but there are different options depending on, you know, where you are and the level of appointment um, that exists. That's really good to know, because again, everybody wants to know. <laughs> it's like, I don't like what they did. I don't like this decision. Don't they know they're a narcissist? What do we do? You know, all of that sort of stuff. And, you know, as 
we've said there are good ones and there are bad ones. There are ones that really look at every text if you submit it. They look at every single thing. And there are others I have seen that never interviewed the teachers, never went to the doctors, never did this, never did that, right? And that's where you have the more likely whole of proving that their judgment wasn't right. I mean, I just to, to put to throw out an anecdote, I once had a a CFI, a child and family investigator. And it was, she was very inexperienced. And and my client was dating someone was actually living with someone. And the evaluator went through the process and never spoke with the, uh, essentially the, the second father or the, the stepfather, um, and, and really, you know, came out in favor of the first father, the biological, uh, father, we went to trial and it was over relocation, you know, like the kind of there's, you know, do you go out of state or not? And the judge just disregarded the evaluator's recommendation. And it, I think in large part, uh, based on his, uh, ruling, it was because the evaluator just didn't even collect, you know, the, the necessary information. And so when you get into the cognitive bias, the, uh, confirmation bias, there's all these different kinds of bias that can exist. Um, you know, there's, there's evaluators that, um, you know, are, are biased against, uh, men, uh, or, or women. And so when you get into that, uh, that is, is really, it's critical that people understand that those biases can, you know, can and do exist and breaking those down and, and really making sure that they, uh, you know, understand that, uh, those, there are opportunities. It, it is hard. Um, and it is, it can be very expensive, um, when you're dealing with those situations. Wow. Is there anything we missed before we close this up tonight? Oh, I'm sure there is Tracy, but we could go on and on. Uh, but you know, if listeners have, you know, additional, uh, questions, they can feel free to, um, shoot me an email and we have a lot of information. I referenced our, our podcast of our, uh, divorce at altitude. It is focused on, uh, Colorado family law. You've been a guest on there. We've had, you know, a number of, of guests, parenting, uh, experts, mental health experts, um, talk about narcissism, custody evaluations, how to deal with this. Cause there's so many, it's a multifaceted, you know, issue because people, you know, need to work on themselves. They need to, uh, prepare themselves. They need to involve the right, um, you know, uh, in professionals and really understand the tools at their disposal and figure out what's best for their family and th them, because, you know, this is the most important stuff in people's lives is their, their kids and their livelihoods. And uh, there's so many different aspects that is just more, uh, than just one episode, but hopefully people learned, uh, you know, something a little bit, whether, uh, maybe kind of, uh, prompted some thought and, you know, really appreciate the, the time for having me on. Thank you for being here. I know you just told them about the podcast and everybody, it is an awesome podcast. You're getting not legal advice, you're getting legal information, you're getting an education and that's what is going to help you because right now we're talking about this thing. What about that thing and that thing and that thing? Ryan's an expert. So tell them again, the name of your podcast and tell them the name of your website so that they can find you and reach out. Yeah. Thanks, Tracy. So um, my last name is Kalamea, uh, K-A-L-A-M-A-Y-A. -A -A. Uh, the firm is Kalamea Gosha. Um, we can be found at kalamea.law. There's no uh, .com there, but if people just search my uh, name, uh, Ryan uh, Kalamea, then they'll be able to find us. And we have links on the podcast. The podcast is Divorce at Altitude. It's found on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google, uh, anywhere that they uh, can listen to podcasts. And, you know, we'll have links on uh, our uh, website to the show. But Tracy, again, thank you for the opportunity to speak with your uh, audience on a really important topic. Thank you for being here. And we're going to put a lot of those links down below in our show notes. And I am so grateful that you're here and um, that you're here in my state as a good resource for me. So thank you so much, Ryan. Thanks again. I hope you found that helpful. He's so brilliant. Please go check out his podcast. He really does put out a lot of helpful information. Got some great stuff on his website. And not to mention that he's just a really great guy. And he's always been a resource for me. And I'm happy to call him my friend. So um, 
If you are interested in looking for help with your divorce with a narcissist, um, you can find information on me at my website, NarcissistAbuseSupport.com. I am a divorce coach. My name is Tracy Malone, and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you.